Good morning again. Um, I'm glad that you're here today. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, um, we'll be 28 through 45 today. In just a second, I'll read for that, read that, and then I'll pray for us. I've been meaning to tell you what Bible translation I used for the last two weeks, but I have forgotten to do so. Um, I've been preaching from the CSB, which is the Christian Standard Bible. It's a faithful translation. It's easy to understand and comprehend. Uh, it's what a lot of your Sunday school material is in, depending on which Sunday school class you're in. I also like the ESV a lot as well, but whatever version that you want to read is the best version for you. If you're willing to read it, if you're used to something that you've always had, just keep reading what it is that you'll actually read. So if that's the KJV, NIV, NASB, NLT, or something else, I'd encourage you to keep reading those, whatever it is that works for you. But this is what works for me. It's what our Sunday school material is in as well. I'm going to read Mark 1, 28 through 45 for us. At once the news spread about the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of Galilee. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I've come. He went on into Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him on his knees and begged him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Then he sternly warned him and sent him away at once, telling him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go and show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and to spread the news with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But he was out in deserted places and they came to him from everywhere. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are the great physician, as we sung to you earlier, that you are willing to heal people, that you were able to do it, and that you showed us what it meant through your word, Lord. We pray that as we look at this text together, that uh, the truths of it will come to our mind, that will be easy to understand, and the applications will not be something that we leave as we walk out this door, but that will stay with us and that we will try to take with us and to be changed by your word, not merely hearers, but doers of it also. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today we have what is called our first Markin sandwich. Um, that is a technique that God, through his Holy Spirit, told John Mark to write down to tell a story. And so what that is, is we have two similar stories on the front and the back end of our verses today, with a part in the middle that helps us to fully understand the front and the back as well. And so the outsides of the story need the middle of the story, and the middle of the story needs the outsides of the story, just like a sandwich, right? And so that is what is happening here today. Uh, I wanted to bring your attention to that because this is a technique that Mar John Mark uses throughout his time in the Gospel of Mark to explain things. I believe the main idea of this passage is this, that Jesus healed people to spread the Gospel message, and that comes from the middle of that Mark and Sandwich there. But let us start at the beginning. Verse 28 tells us after last week, after he healed the man with the unclean spirit, it said at once the news about him spread through the entire vicinity of Galilee. Jesus has become very popular very quickly because of his healings. And he's going to get away from the synagogue and go to Simon's house. So let's look at verse 29 and 30 together. 
As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. We have our setting, right? We're inside Simon's house with the four disciples that we have currently, and Jesus and Simon's mother-in-law. And so we have a problem. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, uh, and so at that might not sound so bad to us, right? Take some ibuprofen, you know, sleep a little bit, you'll be fine the next day. But fever in their time, who knows what would happen, right? Not very much medicine of any to speak of um, or other than herbal things. So this could be bad. She could pass away from this. She could, we don't know the severity of it because of what happens in just a second. So what is Jesus' response to this problem of Simon's mother-in-law being sick and with a fever? Verse 31 tells us, So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. So Jesus goes, and he heals Simon, Peter's mother-in-law. Some scholars think that this is the reason that uh, Peter denied Jesus later, because he healed his mother-in-law. All right. Some of you got it. Uh, But in all seriousness, she had a fever. She was confined to bed, like we talked about, not sure what's going to happen to her. But Jesus takes her by the hand, and he raises her up, and the fever left her. And she responded in a way that we should all learn from her example. She said she began to serve them. She had a sickness. She was hurting. She was stuck. She was unable to do anything. And then Jesus showed up. Do you make the connection here, church, to yourself? We were spiritually sick. Not just sick, but dead in our sins. No way to make ourselves better. No hope of a right relationship with God. Then Jesus comes along. He extends an invitation to us to follow him, to get up, to do the things that he's called us to do. And we can learn from Simon's mother-in-law's example is that once she is healed, once she has been physically healed, and once we have been spiritually healed, we should want to serve Jesus. Those who are healed by Jesus want to serve Jesus because we realize there was nothing that we did to deserve to be taken from our dead, sinful nature to alive in Christ. And we realize that it's only by grace alone that that happens. Through faith alone. And when you realize that, that you didn't deserve it any more than anyone else. You weren't better than anyone else. But that you accepted Jesus. You come to an appreciation of that free gift that he gave you. And out of that appreciation of the free gift he gave you, that overflow as we call it. We say, Jesus, what can I do to help? Jesus, how can I serve my family? How can I serve my church? How can I serve my community? How can I serve the world because of what you've done for me? How can I help your gospel message in this town, in this community? How can I help it in my church? What is my church asking me? How can I be a better husband, be a better father, be a better mother, grandmother, Whatever it is, how can I be a better son or daughter to my family? What is it that you have called me to do? Because I realized that I was sick and needed your help, and you reached out and you grabbed me by the hand and you took me. And so we we learn from her example because those who are healed by Jesus want to serve Jesus. And of course, this news from the synagogue, from the man from last week, and Simon's mother-in-law only makes Jesus more popular. Let's look at verses 32 through 34 together. When evening came, after the sun had set, they brought to him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door. And he held many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Everyone in town who had a sickness realized, I need to meet this Jesus guy. I need to talk to him. I need his help. And so there's these crowds of people trying to see Jesus who are sick and people who, you know, have 
been uh, demon-possessed, and he drives out these demons. And then there's that interesting part at the end of verse 34 there, right? He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Um, there's been a lot of ink spilled on this topic of this idea. Um, this theme is called the Messianic Secret. And there's a lot of different theories to what it all it means, but the one that makes the most sense to me uh, is that it was not time for Jesus to be revealed as the Messiah yet. And so that is why he's not letting these demons speak. Uh, uh, in the Gospel of John, there was a time where Jesus did a miracle, and they were going to make him king after that miracle. And that's not the reason that Jesus came, because at that time, there's a lot of preconceived human ideas about what the Messiah was going to be. Rome is in charge of Israel at this time, and so the idea of a Messiah is, hey, we've got a military guy that's going to show up. He's going to free us from Rome. We're going to rule ourselves again. And that's not the reason that Jesus came. So I believe that's the main reason not to permit the, the demons to speak about him being the Messiah because there's a lot of these ideas attached to the, the thought of the Messiah that weren't God's ideas about it, that they were human ideas from the time that they were living in. So we get back to the sick and demon-possessed people. They realized the state that they were in. They realized, I need Jesus. I need to meet this guy that has healed other people. I need to, this guy that everyone's talking about, I need to meet him personally. I need an encounter with Jesus personally. And the thing was, is them and ourselves, them physically, they needed to be humble to come to Jesus with their sickness and issues. Us uh, spiritually, we need to have an understanding of where we are, of a humbleness to ourselves, right? Jesus later will say, it's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy, right? Is he saying that there were people that didn't need him? No, he's saying there's people that didn't realize they needed him. We are sick. We need the great physician. We need Jesus to come and heal us because we have no way to do it ourselves. And to do so, we have to realize that we are sick, which requires a humbleness on our part to say, I can't do anything about this. There's nothing I can do to make myself better. That's what these people understood, and that's what we have to understand as well. Many of you in this room have realized that, obviously. Maybe some of you haven't, but the many of you that sit in this room have realized this, have people who aren't here today, who aren't in a church today somewhere, that have not realized their need for Jesus. Family members, sons, daughters, brothers, fathers, sisters, whoever it might be. And it hurts to even think about that right now, that they have not realized their need for Jesus. Keep praying for them. Keep inviting them to church. Pray that God will humble them and make them realize their need for a Savior. And because he can still do it. And he still is in the business of saving people. Even the people that seem far off from God, right? Even the people that we'd say, there's no way that person is ever going to realize they need Jesus. And sometimes they do. They come to it because God is still at work in them. So keep praying. Keep talking to them about Jesus. Keep inviting them to church, wherever it is. And so Jesus has become extremely popular. These people are... At his door, there. So, what is his next move? Verses 35 through 38, they're this middle of the Mark and Sam, which we've been talking about. Let's look at 35 together. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. What do you personally do when life gets busy and hectic? Do you want. 30 minutes away from your spouse and your kids just to get some peace and quiet? Do you go to TikTok or Instagram and just scroll mindlessly for a little while? Hope it makes you feel better. Hope you see something funny on there. Do you go to your favorite beverage, your favorite comfort food? Do you turn on the TV or turn on Netflix and find something that can just numb you out for a little while? You can try to forget you take your anger out on someone else when your life is busy and hectic? 
what is it that you do? No matter what it is you choose, we see that when Jesus' life gets busy and hectic, he goes away from the chaos to a deserted place and pray. He prays. He spends time with his Father. He prioritizes that throughout his ministry. And if Jesus had to be intentional to get away, to spend time praying, like Heather talked about, how much more do we need to do it? You might have to get up 30 minutes earlier or go to bed 30 minutes later or, or use your lunch break to open your Bible instead of whatever it is you normally do, watch a show on your phone or whatever it might be. It's important. Let's t- find a time and a place to get away and do what Jesus did. Pray to the Father. Open up your Bible. Read the Scriptures. And kids, tonight I want you to do something Different, maybe, for you. I want you to pray for your parents instead of them praying for you. Parents, you can, of course, still pray for them, but I want your kids to pray for you out loud. Kids, just take some time to talk to God about your parents with them right there. I think they do a lot of the praying in your family, probably. I would encourage you tonight to pray for, to, for your mom and dad with them in the room with you. Even though Jesus was doing the best thing he possibly could do in this moment, giving away, spending time with his father, people still questioned him. Let's look at verse 36 and 37. Simon and his companions searched for him, and when they found him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. Simon and the other disciples looking for Jesus, they find him. They say, Jesus, you've got places to be. You've got a schedule to run. You've got, you know, people that need to be healed, people that need to hear you preach. We've got all these things for you, Jesus. We need to get some more appointments down on your schedule. Right? Sound familiar? There's always somebody else that we can help, right, that wants our help, whether it's work or family or whatever it might be. But Jesus knew he needed to spend time with his Father. And he got a way to do that. And he ran at a pace in his ministry that was sustainable. And we need to learn to run at that pace too. Is your schedule so busy you can't spend time with God? Are there some things we can take off our schedule to make time for the best thing that we could do? Jesus knew he needed to pray because he was going to have to handle people constantly coming to him needing things. He was going to have to teach them, and ultimately he was going to have to die on the cross for our sins. So Simon, his companions, say, everybody's looking for you, Jesus. What is his response? Verse 38. And he said to them, let's go on to the neighboring villages so that I may preach there too. This is why I have come. So Jesus gives us an insight for his reason of being on earth. Some people say Jesus was here to heal people, to make people better physically. That was the main reason he's come. And sandwiched in between healing Simon's mother-in-law and healing this leper that we're going to talk about. um, He says, no, the reason that I've come is so I may preach. And so that main idea of the passage, I think, again, is Jesus healed people to spread the gospel message. There are certain groups of people that say Jesus wants you to always be healthy and wealthy, and that's why he came to the earth. But Jesus' healing people came about so people would know he's the Son of God, that he's not just another prophet, he's not just someone special, that he is truly the Son of God, and that he's doing these things so that people could be healed spiritually as well. Because time and time again throughout the gospel, Jesus meets physical needs so he can meet their spiritual needs. And it's things that we might have to do in our community or on mission trips or things like that or however we do or Operation Christmas Child where there's a need for kids who don't celebrate Christmas, don't have any toys to speak of things and we pack up those boxes and we meet their, we, we give them something to bring joy to their lives or happiness I should say. And then they get to share the gospel with them. They meet their physical needs. We send toothbrushes. We send different things so that we can say, we want you to know about this Jesus person. 
And so he comes to meet these needs, but he does it so he can spread the gospel message. Physical needs of Simon's mother-in-law and the leper, they probably seem pretty serious. But Jesus knew that ultimately what they needed was an encounter and a relationship with him, a spiritual changing of their heart, not just of their physical condition. And so he's going to do it time and time again throughout Mark and the other Gospels that we see these encounters with people. But now we've gone from just a fever to something very serious. Let's look at verses 39 and 40 together. He went into Galilee preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Then a man with leprosy came to him and on his knees begged him, If you were willing, you can make me clean. So he's going, he's doing what he does. He's preaching in synagogues, he's driving out demons. And a man with leprosy came. This was a very serious skin condition. Um, it affected the nervous system as well. And ultimately, it would always lead to death in this time period because there was no cure for it. It was always fatal, and it always ended up killing the person. But they would suffer for many, many years before that happened. Physical pain uh, as well as other pains. If you look at Leviticus 13, 45 through 46 with me, um, of course, Leviticus is where Bible reading plans go to die. But um, there's a lot of interesting things in there too. But, you know, it's laws about clean and unclean things. And so there's a lot of about a person with skin conditions. But this very end of um, the skin conditions here, a serious case, which will be known as leprosy later, as this man has, 13, 45, and 46 says, this, The person who has a case of serious skin disease is to have clothes torn and his hair hanging loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He will remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. So a person with leprosy was not only in physical pain, but they're in emotional pain as well and spiritual pain. They were unclean. They were cut off from the rest of the people. They were unable to enter the temple, unable to enter towns. He could not live with his family if his family were clean, if his family were not also have leprosy. He was isolated. He had no hope for a life of meaning and purpose. He had no way to make himself clean. You seeing the similarities here, church? If not, let me spell it out for you. You were in a spiritual state of being dead. You were unclean. You were dead in your sins. I was dead in my sins. We were cut off from a relationship with God because He is holy and we are not. And at some point, we came to the realization, hopefully, if you sit in this room, that you've already made that realization. That there was nothing you could do and you fell to your feet and said, Jesus, make me clean if you are willing. That is what the man with leprosy asked and it's what we asked too. Maybe not with those exact words, of course, but it's the same idea, the same heart of the matter is, Jesus, we need you to do something for us. There is nothing we can do. We are sick, we were dead in our sins with no hope of be becoming spiritually alive without Jesus. We were cut off from the people of God because we had not made a profession of faith. And so he begs to be made clean. What was Jesus' response? 41 and 42. Move with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched him. I am willing, he told him, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Jesus was moved with compassion, church, for the man with leprosy. He saw a son of Israel hurting, away from society, unclean, cut off from his brothers and sisters. When the ask, man asked, I know you can do this, will you? He said, I am willing, be made clean. Jesus is moved to compassion when we come to him with that realization 
that we are sick and we need Him for the first time. And Jesus is moved with compassion when we ask for His help. When we go to Him and say, Jesus, I really messed it up this time. I know you, I'm following you already, but I made some mistakes. You can bring that to Jesus and He will be moved with compassion time and time again. And many of us may have believed the lie at some point, whether in here or if you're listening on the radio or watching on Facebook, that I need to make myself, I need to get some things right in my life before I come to Jesus and before I come to church. And that's the total opposite way of thinking about it because you can't make yourself right. You might get a little bit better on the outside looking in, you might fix some of your own problems, but you're never going to pull yourself out of a life of sin without Jesus' help. And so Jesus is waiting and eager to show you compassion. He's waiting for you to say, can you make me clean? He is waiting for you to ask him that. And whatever situation that may be, Jesus is willing to enter that and be there with you. And move to compassion and help you in those situations. So the leper is made clean immediately. That word we talked about. That quick action that we see in Mark. Things happen very quickly. What does Jesus tell him to do? And then what does he actually do? Two different things here. Verses 43 through 45. Then he sternly warmed him and sent him away at once. Telling him, see that you say nothing to anyone. But go and show yourself to the priests and offer what was commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Yet he went out and began to proclaim it widely and spread the news, with the result that Jesus could no longer enter a town openly. But he was out in deserted places, and they came to him from everywhere. So Jesus says, go to the priest and uh, make the offering that you're supposed to, as it says in, in the law, to do. And I believe this was more of that messianic uh, secret we were talking about earlier. I don't think it was yet Jesus' time to be revealed as the Messiah. So he tells the man not to, not to share this openly. But the man doesn't listen to Jesus. And that's something that we see throughout Mark as well. People um, not following Jesus' directions for whatever reasons. But this man goes and proclaims the good news of his healing. And I understand... You're like, well, why didn't he listen to Jesus, right? And that's my first thought when reading this and studying this. But I also started to begin to think about this man has had leprosy for who knows how long, right? Knows he's going to die at some point. Knows he's in pain every day. Knows that he can't be with his family. He can't go into town. Very limited interaction. Maybe he was part of a leper colony as they had at those times. But not a very exciting life. Not much of anything to look forward to. And then immediately, it's all better. It's gone. How could he not share the news, right? He went from surely dying to being alive. He went from cut off from people to being in relationship with people. And when we have an encounter with Jesus... Hopefully, you are the same way that you can't help but speak about it, right? You went from dead to alive. You went from no, being dead in your sins to being alive in Christ. And that that's the good news is that there wasn't anything I could do, but I just had to accept the free gift that Jesus offered me. And so you start to tell people about that other gift. You start to read your Bible and you say, this spoke to me and you can't help but share the good news with people. And I think that's the main application for us today is that two parts from Simon's mother-in-law and the leper is this, is people who've been healed by Jesus should serve him and spread the good news. We have the best news that could ever be received. We received it. We don't keep it a secret. We're not better than other people who haven't accepted it. We, we have a goal to spread it, to share the good news with them. And it's not just for the pastor to do 
the youth and children's worker, the music people to do. It's for everybody. You encounter people each and every day at your work or wherever it is that I don't run into. And even if I do know them, when, when people find out you're a pastor, these walls start to come up when you try to talk to them, right? Uh, I go to so-and-so church. I was like, I'm just trying to know who you are, right? Or I'm just talking, right? But you get to have that opportunity, right? And they expect me to talk about it, and they might not expect you to talk about it. When you've been healed, you should want to serve Jesus, and you should want to spread the good news. If you're a follower of Jesus already, have you lost that joy that this man had when he was first healed? That joy when you first experienced Christ? Have you forgotten that you were dead in your sins? You've been coming to church so much that you started to think a little more like a Pharisee and less like a sinner forgiven by Jesus. It can happen to all of us. It's happened to me. It's something we have to guard against. Look at the joy the leper had. Shared with everybody. So much so that Jesus can't enter any town around here without people knowing who he is. When we've been healed, we can't help but talk about Jesus and say, Jesus, how can I serve you? I want to be a part of the body of Christ. And part of the body of Christ means that I have a purpose, a spiritual gift that you have given me, and I want to use it for the betterment of my church and the betterment of your kingdom, Jesus. Lastly, we should look at Jesus' example of when he was busy. We make time for God just as he did. We have to find a way to steal away to that quiet place and spend time with him. Let us have our invitation.